Good evening. Welcome to the Arlington Public School Forum this evening, where the focus is going to be on secondary issues. Before we begin, um, Adam Kurowski is going to give you some instructions on how to uh, be in this Zoom meeting. Adam? Thank you, Kathy. The, um, there are a few tools that you can use uh, on your Zoom session. You can change and toggle uh, what you see on the screen from the screen share to our individual um, uh, pictures and, and videos using this toggle button here uh, in the red square. And we'll also at some point later on have a question and answer session. And at the bottom toolbar, when you move your cursor down to the bottom of the screen, a toolbar will pop up and there's a button that says Q and A. And this is where you are able to submit questions to the panelists. Thank you. Back to you, Kathy. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. So thank you to everyone who has submitted questions over the last two days. Uh, we very much appreciate that. In fact, we received quite a few questions, uh, somewhere over 90. So even though uh, we have this question feature on the Zoom this evening, we're going to focus for most of the meeting on the questions that have been submitted. Now, given the, the number of questions we've had, what we've decided to do is to, is to look at themes uh, about specific, uh, specific questions. As, as you might um, guess, many people ask ver different versions of the same question. Um, there were some questions that were submitted that were about individual students, and we are not going to address those this evening. Um, you, if you feel that the, that the question that you had is not answered by the oversights that you're going to give tonight, we're gonna to give you tonight, then please contact your principal of your school with a very specific question about your child. So we have um, this evening uh, different uh, people from the district who are going to address the questions. Um, our speakers this evening are going to be uh, Roderick McNeil, who is the Assistant Superintendent for Curriculum and Instruction. Matthew Janger, Dr. Matthew Janger, he is um, the high school principal. We have Brian Maringer, who is the Audison Middle School principal. Kristen DeFrancisco, the principal of Gibbs School. Um, I will also be answering some of the questions this evening, uh, Dr. Kathleen Bodie, and uh, Dr. Susan Bisson, who is our Director of Digital Learning, will be answering a couple of questions as well. In addition to these panelists, we have uh, some other people from district administration who will be here this evening to ask, uh, to be another resource and to answer any questions that might come up later in the evening. Uh, Sarah Bird, who is our Director of Social Emotional Learning and Counseling. And Allison Elmer, who is the Director of Special Education. So uh, let us begin um, with the questions this evening. We're going to start with Dr. McNeil, who is going to address some of the district-wide questions and themes that have come up uh, in the last couple of days. Dr. McNeil? Yes, thank you, uh, Dr. Bodie. So uh, I appreciate all of the questions that came in. Uh, I think it's going to be helpful to clarify, and hopefully it will um, help to alleviate some of the um, anxiety and confusion that we know that parents are feeling during this very unprecedented time. So the first theme uh, I want to address is around the manner in which we're connecting with students um, to have the live connections with students through e throughout each week. Uh, the first, uh, the, the philosophy behind the various uh, ways that we are connecting with students, um, we want to utilize the synchronous live chats or live meetings, if you will. We're encouraging uh, teachers to make at least uh, two contacts with students throughout the week uh, and utilize synchronous meetings. Uh, and that is through and that is the reason for that is to uh, keep those connections, you know, address different social emotional 
uh, issues that may be going on with students and you know provide a comfort level for them and also to you know to maintain that connection uh, that you know is usually there when we're in session the asynchronous uh, videos that teachers are uh, creating for the lessons are specifically geared towards providing that type the, the the direct instruction that students will need in order to complete the assignments uh, the synchronous meetings can also consist of office hours and uh, that students can contact teachers if they have a question about the assignments. Uh, we're not using Zoom because if there were, there were, uh, initially there were security issues and at this point we are not uh, satisfied with uh, the security issues being addressed. As a result, we, have, we are going to use Google Hangouts Meet and continue to use Zoom. Uh, Google Hangouts Meet. It's a more secure connection that we have with students, and uh, we are assured that it will it cannot be hacked, um, like uh, some of the instances we have heard uh, through the use of Zoom. So basically, the asynchronous uh, videos are for instructional purposes. The synchronous contacts are for students to contact teachers if they have questions about assignments, and also to maintain those. Uh, connections and to really address the social emotional well-being and to make sure that we're addressing the social emotional well-being of our students. Uh, tracking assignments, that was another uh, theme that came up within the questions. Uh, just recently we had a discussion with secondary administrators and we're going to make sure that the assignments uh, that teachers are collecting from students are going to be inputted into PowerSchool. Now the assignments that are inputted into PowerSchool uh, are the ones that will be utilized uh, to give the students at the middle school a uh, M, P, or U. Uh, the, the M stands will be uh, uh, given to students who create, I mean, who uh, complete all of the assignments and are putting forth uh, the expected effort uh, that is needed to complete the assignments uh, to the expectations of the teachers. And also, uh, so a P will be given to students who are doing it, uh, doing that work in a partial manner. They're completing most, but not all of the assignments, um, or they're completing less than half, or not not to the expectation of the of the teacher. Uh, and then a U are for those students who are not uh, completing any of the assignments or putting forth any of the efforts. And that that's at the middle school, at the high school. Uh, the designation is used uh, as an audit, and those are for students who are completing all of this, all of the assignments uh, that are required each week. And so, uh, as students uh, complete their assignments, uh, they're being put into the uh, Power School. This is also a way that uh, parents can track the progress of their students and see which assignments have been completed and which ones still need to be completed. Uh, we are also giving students an opportunity when they receive feedback to revise their assignments that they've completed and resubmit them. So we're trying to give students every opportunity to meet the expectations uh, that the student that the teachers have for the completion of assignments and the, the amount of effort that it will take. Uh, the theme, uh, the third theme, uh, was you know, we asked the questions around key, you know, how the curriculum is being structured moving forward. Uh, and just responding to what the state has uh, asked us to do. Uh, we are focusing on key understandings in each of the content areas. These key understandings are the ones that have been selected by curriculum leaders and teachers. And they are the, these are the key understandings that will prepare students for the next level uh, for next fall in, in, in each one of the content areas. So we're focusing on those key understandings the assignments are being aligned to address those key understandings, and that is those are the assignments that have been a, that given to students, and that is where they'll be getting the feedback, and hopefully they'll be revising their assignments, submitting them again, and all our students will be successful. As it relates to uh, the fall, uh, we will make we and this is also by focusing on these key understandings will also allow us to track what the students are covering in the spring, and then for the fall teachers will be, be able to look back at those key understandings and um, they will be able to uh, uh, look at the curriculum that they usually teach in the fall 
and make those accommodations and adjustments to to cover the material and maybe and also recover and cover some of the material that has not been um, cover some of the material again to give the students an opportunity to review it. So in the fall, we will have ways of assessing where students are looking at the key understandings that were taught in the spring and be able to address those key understandings in the fall to make sure that students will be able to move on in the curriculum uh, as they would if we were in session. Thank you, Dr. McNeil. Uh, you acknowledge very well the, the unprecedented situation that we all find ourselves in. And there has been a considerable amount of work around key understandings uh, this, um, as we have really looked very carefully at our curriculum as to what are the most important concepts that have yet to be taught. Because um, keep in mind that we have already gone through roughly um, three quarters of the school year. So we're, we're identifying what those are the understandings that our students would need in order to be able to move forward to the next school year. We'll talk more about some of these issues with each one of the presentations from um, our principals. So Dr. Janker, would you like to begin talking about some of the questions that were, have been asked? You need to unmute yourself. We're all learning a new way of living here yeah. and communicating. So, um, hang on. So, thanks, Dr. McNeil. I mean, first, I just want to acknowledge how challenging this time is, I know, for many families, for many students. Um, I know that lots of folks are you know, first responders. A lot of our students are out there as essential workers, and there's a lot of issues for a lot of families during this time. And the second thing that's happening while we're in the midst of all this is that everybody is drinking from a fire hose of information. There's so many de details of how we do things in school. So the first thing, first two themes actually that I have there, there on the slide um, have to do with the questions that came about people who really just weren't fully understanding how they could process everything that's happening and how things were working. So let me first just talk a little bit about communications. We really are trying to get out all of the information, but there's lots of details. And so places that you can look in order to get that information and to go through it, there is the FAQ, which you'll find at spyponders.com on our shutdown info site. You go right to our website, you'll find that and you can click through and there's a lot of those documents. On the FAQ for families, there's a questions tab. And if you put in their questions, like the ones that you sent in for this forum, I'm answering them every morning on the daily announcements. And I don't care if I get the same question over and over again, I'll answer the same question over again and I'll go back and I'll change the FAQ to try to make it be clearer. And those daily announcements are also intended to make it so that we feel like there's a little bit of a dialogue going forward. Um, and then the teacher's primary form of communication is gonna be the Google Classroom. And in the past, teachers, uh, parents didn't necessarily feel like they needed to check into the Google Classroom, but now people really want to track those assignments. There's not a lot of time, and the, te the parents are in the position of doing a lot more of the monitoring. So contact those teachers. You can sign up to have the assignments on the Google Classroom shared with you so you can get more of that information. And then, as Dr. McNeil said, in PowerSchool, that's where they're going to be tracking whether or not you meet expectations. And I'll get to that in a second. But so they're in PowerSchool, You'll get the weekly assignments, your kids will have a week to send them in, and then the teachers will probably take about a week to get everything up to speed. So you might be lagging behind a little bit. But <clears throat> what they're gonna be telling you is whether the assignments or the weekly work meets this standard, whether there's work that needs to be redone to meet the standard, um, and eventually at some point potentially whether work is missing that can be made up or whether work is missing that can't. And we're gonna be flexible around work that can't be made up in the first few weeks as the kids find their feet and footing. So now let me switch to the second, which is this question about how does it work? And a lot of that has to do with questions around transcripts and requirements. And the reason why at the high school, there's a lot more pages of explanation and we're using different language than they are at the middle schools at Odison and the Gibbs is because at the high school, we have this issue of credits for graduation, grades that people put on resumes for college, GPA, and make all of those little details really make a difference. 
And what we want to do is in PowerSchool, we need to come up with codes and programs that don't go into GPA and that don't calculate and don't require us to reprogram or change our state reports. So that's part of why we're using the audit. So people are confused about what an audit is. During the regular year, we have the opportunity that sometimes, not often, but sometimes kids attend a class, participate in the class, but don't get a grade and don't get credit towards graduation. That's called an audit. And it doesn't go into your class thing. It's just records for colleges that you participated in that class. And so that's what we're using in this case. And the idea of the audit is that students who do the work in the class get recognized for having participated in the class, but students who aren't able to do that work are not penalized. They just don't get the recognition. So one question people have had is what happens if I take the, if I say I'm going to audit and then I don't succeed in meeting the expectations. If you don't meet the expectations, the audit will not be listed on your transcript. There won't be a penalty there. You just won't be able to show the colleges that you did that because you participated, but you didn't complete the standards. And the second question then is what are those expectations? So the teachers are going to put out two and a half hours, two to three hours of work a week. Over seven classes, if you're taking a full academic load, that's going to add up to about three and a half hours of work. If you don't take all of those classes, you're going to have a little bit less. But the idea is that they give you two and a half hours of work and you're expected to be able to complete it and to do the work. So if you don't get it right, they're going to go over the answers with you. That's the feedback piece. If you have challenges with doing it, they're going to go over the work with you. But if you just jot down the work and hand the thing in incomplete, then it doesn't meet the standards. So this is really about participation and effort that makes the audit happen. Um, and so the idea is there will not be credits for this. Students have already received their credits for this year. And that's really important for anybody who's worried about graduation. If you had a full year class, you've got the grade now, it's the 30 terms worth of work, and you've got five credits for that, that class. If it was a semester class, you've got two and a half credits. If it was a quarter class, you've got one and a quarter credits. And then there was some confusion also about the PE requirement. So if you're a freshman, your PE class goes all year, you've now got credit for that PE class. If you were a sophomore or a junior, you needed to take one or two classes of PE during the year, and it's possible that you were registered for that class for term four, and there's no way to get credit for term four. So we've dropped that expectation for those, those two years of classes by one section. So they won't be able, they won't be forced to push that into their later years. They won't be behind when they go on to their junior or senior year. And then the last, and this is a separate issue, is there are some students who were failing going into term three. And if coming out of term three, you have not passed the class and have not earned the five credits, then you should, and you should know who you are because the deans have been reaching out to those folks, the teachers have been reaching out to those folks, and the counselors have been reaching out to those folks. But if you are one of those folks, you are on a different path because you have an opportunity to do credit recovery. What you might have had to do during summer school, you can now do now in order to recover those credits. The next question for folks was around expectations. I've answered some of that already. Um, some of that was about expectations for students. They're expected to do the work. They can ask for extensions. They can um, redo a few times as long as they're making a reasonable effort. And I know the teachers are gonna be flexible and that's something we're gonna adjust on as we find our way forward on this. Um, the next question was about expectations for teachers. What are they going to be giving you? And some of that Dr. McNeil talked about. So our teachers have been asked generally to provide two hours of synchronous, that means available at the same time as the students are doing it, two hours at least of contact with students. Many, probably most of our teachers are doing some of that through the Google Hangout Meets or the Google Meet Hangouts with groups of students. Some of them don't have that technical capacity. It's not what they're doing. They may be doing it through an online chat. They may be doing it through email office hours but most of them are doing it through some version um, of, an, of a hangout. So the challenge for parents is I know that people really value those synchronous meetings. We really value those synchronous meetings. They're helpful. 
Um, but there's two pieces around the synchronous meetings. One is if a teacher is only doing two hours of those, of those a week over five classes, they may cluster groups of classes in order to put in an hour, but it's not going to be five or six hours or the contact time the way we would have had that during the regular school year. And one of the reasons why the district made that choice about being primarily asynchronous is the other thing that came back from parents is that for many folks expecting their students to sit there and be available at a given hour or a given time wasn't possible for them. So it's our expectation that all of the work can be done synchronous, asynchronously, which is to say independently. So there's two different pieces. On the one hand, teachers will be available for a total of two hours a week and will likely have some sort of meeting with a class, but that meeting is not required. It's a good idea. It's probably the best and most efficient way to get the work, but the teacher will make it possible for you to do the work independently as long as you do that in a timely fashion and the teacher will be available to give you feedback. So last piece of that is penalties. This balance that we were trying to find is how do you on the one hand provide challenging work and incentivize students given the structure of school um, so that they feel like they should do it and they're gonna get rewarded for doing it and they're gonna get academically challenged. And on the other hand, how do we not penalize students who are not able to do that? And so that's part of why the decision was made about the audit. It was possible that we could have done it with bonus credits, but where we did it was with this approach. For some students, they're looking for more challenge. And uh, my recommendation is within the school system, the challenge would be through the MOOCs. We've offered about nine of them so far. We have a couple hundred students participating in those. We'll probably be offering another wave in the next week or so, now that we know what's going on with the term four. Um, and the other option is to look at other kinds of enrichment work you can do, either work that just grows your learning or potentially work that you can give separate information to uh, schools about. And at the same time, we are very concerned for many kids that this can be a huge stressor. And that's a hard balance. Some parents have said, don't tell my kid this is optional. And some parents have said, um, please, please, please don't stress my kid out by expecting them to do all of this. So the answer is we think it's good for you. We think it will help you be prepared. Um, but we also want families to make choices that are safe and appropriate for them. Um, and then the last question a lot of folks asked were about issues related to our counseling department. Um, and Sarah Bird is here. She'll answer some of them later, I'm sure, when we come to them. But my sort of quick overview of that um, is, is twofold. One, the counselors are available. They have been working around the clock, reaching out to students, answering emails. If they haven't heard back, if you haven't heard back from them, politely email them again. They've lost you in the pile of emails, but they're absolutely keeping up with questions about where should I go to college? What should I do about changes for the fall? Because a lot of these things are up in the air for all of us. For juniors, we know that lots of them are trying to figure out how do I now make choices about colleges? Um, and there's information on the counseling site um, about how you can do virtual visits and colleges are obviously adjusting to these new times as well. Um, and I know Ms. Bird, if anybody asks about it, we'll happily go on to more detail about that. Um, the next question is about students transitioning into the high school. We have usually had this freshman advantage. Um, those folks are planning and figuring out ways to get that information out remotely and thinking about what it is we will do in the fall when we have a good idea of what the fall is going to look like. And then the last is social emotional support. And um, from day one, the counseling department systematically went through our students, went through their caseloads, went through people they were concerned about, have been reaching out to folks in order to get that information. So we really feel like people um, have had, we have reached out as much as we can, but the other, and the other question is, teachers also sometimes refer to us and we reach out. But if there are issues around social emotional support, um, there are now lots of online resources. You can find them on our sites, but please contact your counselor, contact our social workers, contact the school nurse, um, and people will absolutely refer you to the appropriate resources. Thank you very much for your time. Thank you, Dr. Janger. Um, we are now going to move on to the Odison Middle School, and Mr. Maringer is here to talk about uh, the questions that have been put forward around Odison. 
Mr. Manager. Thank you, Kathy. Um, first of all, I just wanted to thank you for the opportunity to be able to talk to so many people here tonight. Um, I hope everyone is safe and healthy. I also just want to express that if anyone needs any questions answered, please email me or call me at the Audison. Um, I enjoy the dialogue that I am having with parents and I would much rather clear something up before something um, becomes too big or something is confused. So if you need to, please reach out to me so that we can have a dialogue. Um, you know, it's interesting on the panel, if you look at Dr. McNeil, uh, Kristen, Matthew, and myself, we all have, right now, we all have children in middle school and high school. So I think we are trying to look at this as not only the perspective of an educator, but also of a parent. And we understand many of the struggles parents are going through at this time. So I did want to bring up a few things that people have um, brought up to me and kind of some of the themes that are going on. The first thing is the workload and what does a week look like at the Audison? So the first thing is, like Matthew said, we're looking for kids to do about three hours of work. This includes art and physical fitness and other special subjects that are there. By nine o'clock, you should receive, or excuse me, your students should receive any information about assignments, activities, and Google Hangouts for that week. Additionally, they should also be privy to office hours. As a parent, if you'd like to know the office hours of every one of your teachers, please go to the Audison website and under quick links, there is a tab that says office hours. That is when teachers are able to give instant communication back about any problems that is happening that week. For most, just as Matthew said at the high school, most of this is by Google Meets or Google Hangout. Other people, it's by a chat. Some, it might be by a phone call or through Google Classroom. But please look at the office hours so that you know when our teachers are available. I know both Ms. Rubino, who is the eighth grade assistant principal, and Maureen Murphy, who is the seventh grade um, assistant principal, both have given kids tips on how to organize. Because all your activities and assignments should be in by 9 a.m. on Monday, the first recommendation is for students to organize themselves so that they know when they're doing the subjects and so they can plan effectively for the week. One of the major questions that we've had as I think we've had at the high school in the Gibbs is how do I know that my student is doing the work? And Dr. McNeil touched on this a little bit in the intro, but I wanted to come up with it again. Both at Gibbs and at Audison, we have stressed to our teachers that teachers will be calling parents and contacting parents if they haven't heard from them or if they're not participating. The other thing is if you go to power school like you would normally throughout the year, what we are looking to have teachers do is give three quick assessments of whether things are being handed in. If a teacher has an assignment, then it should be one of three remarks that is put into whether they've done it. One is collected. The information was passed in by your student. The other is incomplete. And the third thing is missing. So we are looking for you to follow up just like you would during the school year, but now to find out if your son or daughter did their science work. They should go into the portal, find out from science, and see if it's collected, incomplete, and missing. At the end of the term, there will be three marks that we will give for an overall grade. This is both at the Gibbs and the Audison. They will get an M if they met the requirements and put in good effort. There is a P, which meant it partially met expectation. This meant they were doing some of the work, but it wasn't quite to the standard or expectation, or they've missed some assignments. And the last thing is a U, which is unable to determine and didn't participate. As Matthew had said earlier, we have a lot of students. We have 900 students here at the Audison, and some students are doing fabulously well, and others are struggling. 
and we can't really make determinations during this time if a student is not participating because it's for some reason of a social emotional issue if it's something going on in the family or if it's something they're opting not to do right now families have to make what they feel is the best decision for their own child and because of that we will honor that but we do want to give you feedback whether your child is doing it so please nine o'clock on monday have the students get themselves organized for the week please check up on power school if those assignments are getting in and most importantly call either myself or your teachers if you have any concern for sixth graders coming up to the audison it has been typical that grade level administrators and school counselors have gone down with myself to give a question and answer period and an orientation. That's obviously not happening this year. As well, many times they come up for a tour of the Audison and then we have a parent night. We are trying to get some guidance after hopefully May 18th of how we can transition kids. I would very much like, whether it's during the spring, which is, I would think, doubtful, or during the summer, I'd like to give students the opportunity to go through the Audison and see the classes. I will make sure that I am in contact with the Gibbs parents about any future plans. I also wanted to make sure that everyone understood that we are attempting to get better every week. I think if you look at where we were three weeks ago and now, things have gotten much better. So in the first instance, I know that more people are doing Google Meets than they were three weeks ago. I know that people are sharing technology so that they can be better off as well. The last thing I will say is I will definitely take feedback. Parents have given me just suggestions that sometimes we've missed. We went with a nine o'clock start. Originally, we had gone on Monday that people would get the Google Hangouts or they would get the information on Monday. A parent just called and said, I need to organize my child because both of us work. Can I get it at nine o'clock so that I can help them? It was a great suggestion and we enacted it. So please give me your feedback. Um, I would love to have some dialogue with many of you as we try to get better every week. I was very heartened, for example, that the eighth grade civics had an 80% participation rate. I'm getting information that from algebra classes, it's over 80%. Some of our other classes, however, are not that high and we're trying to figure out what is successful and what is not. Is it the content? Is it the way we're being delivering education to kids? So. I'm hoping three weeks from now, we're a better school than we were right now. Please get in contact with me if you have any questions. Thank you very much for this time. Kathy. Kathy, you're on mute. Thank you. We're all learning this. We we spent a lot of time on a, on on a Zoom or Google Hangout meets, but this is a common thing that happens. We forget that we're muted. Uh, so I'm inviting uh, Kristen DeFrancisco, uh, who is the principal of the Gibbs School, to address some of the questions that have come up uh, from parents. Thank you very much, Kathy. Um, I'd like to begin just by first of all saying thank you to really all of the parents in Arlington. Yeah, I'm, I'm the mom of two daughters who go to school here. Uh, Allie is a, a junior and Zoe is an eighth grader. So I, I am certainly hanging in there right alongside of you. This, this certainly is challenging, but there are lots of silver linings. And I think that that has been a theme for us at Gibbs. One of the, one of the things that I said when, when uh, we learned that the governor was, was closing schools for the rest of the year in Massachusetts was that it's really important for us to remind our students that while our buildings are closed, our schools are not closed, our community is not closed. And so I think that the, the real overarching theme for us at Gibbs has been that our community exists. So before I start talking about the themes that, of questions that were brought to me, um, through this forum, I do want to talk a little bit about some of the things that we've been leaning on to bring community 
or the feeling of community to our students. So we're still having that yearbook cover contest and they're coming in electronically and, and their social distance dropping them off at the, at the, in the lobby on Wednesdays. Um, you know, so it's really been fun to see those come in. Um, we're also still having, you know, I'm going out with announcements in the morning and, and telling jokes and singing songs with our music teacher and, you know, really trying to reach out to the, the kids and the children in that way. So I think the, the overarching theme really is still keeping that community alive. Um, the conversations that I've had with your children over email have been endearing and the thank yous and I know you're working really hard. One of the students told me, you know, she said, you're a role model, Mrs. Francisco. You're really doing a lot of work right now. And you know, it's those kinds of moments that I think we, we need to appreciate how kids are pivoting um, and how they really are being flexible. Um, and as we say, it gives understanding unified and unstoppable. So that has definitely been a silver lining for me um, as we've gone through this process. Um, as, as Adam shares slides with you next, I will be able to talk to you about the, the theme of the questions that came up to me. Um, honestly, most of them were around uh, the curriculum and the curriculum release. So I'll talk a little bit about that. I feel like this is one of our, our Sunday greeting vlogs that I've been doing, which I have to tell you, I've absolutely fallen in love of being able to come out to the community in this way. And it seems to have been a popular method. So I will continue doing that throughout the throughout this uh, May and June. But around curriculum, the questions that I'm getting is why only two curriculum areas each day? And as you've heard my colleagues talk a little bit about this, you're gonna get families that want more and you're gonna get families that want less. So as we're thinking about the sixth grade entry level, what we need to remember that the, the students are 11, 12 years old. Uh, you know, just because we were, we were kind of thrust into this, this environment, that doesn't mean all of a sudden their executive functioning and their frontal lobes magically got to a place where they could manage a lot of things at once. And so we were really careful to think about how students would be managing, understanding what they needed to do each day, which is why we are only releasing two curriculum areas or we're staggering the curriculum areas. Now that doesn't mean they can't work on the assignments on different days of the week. It's more meant to chunk the processing. So because we're balancing between that synchronous and asynchronous opportunities, this is really creating a predictable routine for students as that curriculum comes out. Um, what we know about where we were in the year for developmentally for where sixth graders were, we were just getting ready to start talking about really releasing that final push of responsibility out to our students. Um, without teachers to support that release, we're going a little bit slower than we might have gone if we were back at, at our brick and mortar or at our location. So we're asking them to be responsible for building that schedule but we have some control over around what new things they're being asked to do each day. So for we as a school, that means teachers and administration, we really didn't feel good about releasing nine content areas on a Monday. Um, we didn't feel like the students were gonna be able to process all of that information all at once. So what we have done is paired an LC class, so that's the learning community. And inside the learning community, you're gonna have your math science, social studies, and ELA. And we've paired each one of the English language arts, we've paired each one of those with an ELC area, which is our exploratory learning community. So that's your world language. It's either an art, tech, or DML class. It's family and consumer science, music, and PE. And even as you hear me listing all of those things off, I'm hoping you're getting the feeling or the importance of not having all of those things go out to sixth graders all at the same time. So that explains the staggering of the curriculum. And I think that leads really nicely into the second theme, which is, okay, so you've got all this information and it's being released in a staggered way. How does my child make a schedule? And how do I come up with that three hours of work each day? So in one of the vlogs that I came out to you with, I did do some explaining about the schedule and the students got one of those vlogs as well of their very own. So what we tried to talk with students about at the sixth grade level is chunking your schedule. So you should have different blocks in your schedule. You should be building time for your academics. You should be thinking about exercise. Are you getting outside or are you even doing some exercise inside? 
Um, are you eating your meals? Because remember, our kids are pretty pretty scheduled about when they snack and when they eat. So it's important for us to talk to them about making sure they're doing those things as well. Um, are they taking some time for reflection? And are they also taking some time to have free time to do those things that kind of really um, nourish, nourish their soul, as we call it at school? Um, so what we have done is we've been launching that new content for students and, and trying to help them come up with that schedule is much like what you've heard my colleagues say, by nine o'clock in the morning, students will have the release of the curriculum from the two specific subject areas, and that will include asynchronous videos. So it was important to us that that and the district that that new content came out in a way that students could be watching it once, twice, three times if they if they really needed to. Um, and the best way we felt like we could do that would be through those videos. So. Once they receive those videos, they can really watch them during one of their academic blocks. But in addition, on that day, we've also provided 30 minute office hours for students on that same curriculum. So for example, on Monday, math and PE are the two curriculums that are coming out to students. Math and PE also have 30 minute office hours. Most teachers are conducting those office hours through a Google Hangout. Some teachers might be doing it through a chat, but the majority of them really are going out through Google Hangout. And as Dr. Jenger said, I think every teacher feels like that is the best way to do it, um, that having that interaction with the student, being able to answer questions that come up, um, really is the preferred way. Um, so most teachers are doing that now at this point. Um, and when we released that, we were also able to give the students a specific time for when those Hangouts would happen. We made sure there were no overlaps. Students do not have to choose one over the other. Um, everybody should be free in the schedule when a Hangout is, is offered for them. And I have to say, most of our students are attending those Hangouts. So that's really nice to see too. So now we've got 30 minutes of, of lesson, video lessons at some point that they're watching during the day. Um, and we also have about an hour of office time if you combine the two, the two subject areas. That's already an hour and a half of a three hour block that we're asking students to attend and process. We've also asked them to read for 20 to 30 minutes. You know, now we're up to almost two hours. And then that's giving them about an hour to work on actual, actual assignments. Um, as stated earlier, the students have the entire week to complete the curriculum from its release. So Monday to Monday, Tuesday to Tuesday. Um, we did this during enrichment as well. And so we kept that pretty much the same. We didn't want to switch things up too much for kids. They were really used to the schedule. Um, I'm able to talk about it on announcements in the morning. Ms. Salvatore, the assistant principal, is able to reference it on announcements in the morning. So we really bookended their day um, with some, some real communication from us as administrators. Um, in addition, they also have some advisory hangouts that they're doing. Um, so we've kept that curriculum up as well. Uh, the next thing that I'll talk a little bit about is um, how to manage Google Classroom. That has been a question I not only got through this forum, but I'm also getting that via email. So because the, the staggered curriculum, the way we've set up the staggered curriculum, what students should be able to do on those mornings, on Mondays, on Tuesdays, on Wednesdays, is similar to what Brian talked about when he, or Mr. Marringer talked about when he talked about um, using Monday morning to organize the week. So we're asking sixth graders to use each morning to take a look at those two curriculum areas, go into their Google Classroom, and use an activity tracker to write down their assignments. Um, I'm in the process of modifying that tracker a little bit. Um, the one they're using now is from the enrichment phase, and I feel like we can probably do a little bit of a better job getting them a tracker that is a little more helpful during the new learning phase. So they should have that on Monday morning. Um, I will be using my video announcement to explain that tracker. Um, all of these documents that I'm talking about, uh, we started a Gibbs school-wide Google Classroom, and I'm managing that. So anything that I send out to students via email or anything that I talk to them about on videos gets posted to that Google Classroom. So they have reference to all of those things at any time they want in one space. And then the last question that I'll address this evening um, is about Google Hangout offices, office hours rather. What are they supposed to look like? 
I'm getting some questions now that we've gone to new learning about whether or not students should show up to these hangouts, even if they don't have a question about the assignment, and they absolutely should do that. Uh, what we're talking about with teachers right now is that the kids really want to see each other. They want to say hello to each other. They want to talk to each other. Uh, they really want to have time with their teachers, check in. Um, for most of the sixth graders, show and tell their pets or their siblings are also a very popular show and tell in the advisories that I've popped into. Um, their siblings are not always willing, but they do try to show and tell them anyhow. Um, what we've been trying to do is get teachers to really allow for that, um, that time in the first five, 10 minutes or so of that content area. And then they're, they're kind of spilling into what the assignment was, what questions kids might have about the assignments. And that seems to have been working pretty well. Uh, we also have advisory hangouts and those are strictly social emotional learning. Um, as a matter of fact, um, Sarah Bird, who will probably be answering some questions, she just uh, was a guest speaker at our faculty meeting and presented us with a, a beautiful choice board for teachers to be using during advisory time um, to really get the kids into that routine of getting their mind ready to learn for the day. Um, so I'm really pleased with the ability to use that advisory that we already really had set up when we were, were running school um, from Gibbs. Uh, we've been able to pivot and really um, help kids to, to, to process some of what is going on for them. And as a final uh, reminder to you that my, I've tried to keep my announcements predictable for parents. Wednesday afternoon, you typically are getting an update from me about halfway through the week. And then every evening on Sunday, I am pushing out um, the Sunday greetings to you. I think the big difference is, is that I've been trying to do lots by video. Um, it seems to be that this is a way that parents can either turn it on and listen or watch some of the slides or, um, you know, things like things like that are helping parents to do some multitasking while they're getting their announcements and cooking dinner. And I've gotten a lot of good feedback about that. So I will continue to do that. Um, and that's through those YouTube links. Um, those links so far, I've tried to help assist with making schedules. I've talked about Google Hangouts. I've talked a little bit about growth mindset to assist you as you're, you're moving kids through work and, and successes and maybe some setbacks if they're having any. Uh, I talked a little bit about understanding behavior. You know, kids are going to, behavior has a reason. And uh, I'm sure you're seeing some behaviors you may or may not have seen before during this time. So it's important to, to have patience and understand where that's coming from. And I'm also trying to give you some ideas for family activities. Uh, you know, it's, it's Candyland board games get, get old. <laughs> um, so I'm trying to keep that fresh for you and give you some family activity ideas. Uh, many of you gave me some good feedback about the family music playlist. So um, I have lots of playlists now because you've all shared them with me, which I appreciate for sure. And I've recently also instituted a written version of the remote learning plan, which I've begun to include at the bottom of every single one of my communications. So for those of you that are, are not maybe um, lining up so much with the videos, you also have that in writing to take a look at. And I will include that in each one of my communications right at the bottom. So you're hitting it out of the park. I appreciate your partnership. Um, I can't say enough about your willingness to email me um, and email me in ways that um, I look forward to reading what you say. Uh, I feel like you have a lot of empathy for what we are doing and I appreciate that. I appreciate your compliments. I appreciate your persistence and your grit and the way that you're taking care of your kids during this time. So thank you for the opportunity to come out to you and speak to you in this way. Kathy? Kathy, you're on mute. Thank you, Kristen. Um, I also want to, before I begin with some of the other uh, district issues that have come up, uh, acknowledge that this has been a very challenging time for all of us. I know that there are parents who have, in the questions, have asked, well, why aren't we doing more of the, you know, just a, 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 a virtual school in which students come at 8 o'clock in the morning, 9 o'clock, and have a class. And uh, I, while I have explained this in writings to parents, I, I think it's important to also state it again, that we have really looked at this very carefully. And there's a lot of things we've taken into consideration. And certainly an important part is the equitability um, of that situation. There are, many, there are many students who could do that, but there are also very many students who cannot do that. When we send out a parent survey recently, what we know 
is that um, more than two thirds of the parents said that they would. It was either a three, four, or five in terms of importance. More than half of our parents said it was important to have flexibility in a schedule. We know that there are students who are taking care of younger brothers and sisters while parents are working during the day. Um, we know that there are students that, that have, are still having problems um, accessing the work. And we've been working very digitally over the last uh, number of weeks to make sure that students have access to computers um, and access to internet. But we still have some students that do not have this. So it's important that as we, particularly as we look to the future, that we create equitable situations uh, for students to learn and progress. So we have a blended approach, and you've heard in quite detail how it's working at the three different schools in terms of having asynchronous lessons, which allows students to do the work at night, on the weekends, at times when uh, family uh, responsibilities do not conflict. At the same time, we also want to create those opportunities for students to be able to see, see each other, hear each other, um, and also ask questions. It's, it's, there's sometimes difference between asking a question uh, live versus asking a question by email. So we recognize that this is not perfect. Um, we have tried to be very thoughtful in this. And as we have been doing this work, it is, is very much aligned with what the Department of Secondary, of Elementary and Secondary Education has recommended. And they have recommended this blend of synchronous and asynchronous in, part, in large part because of the equity issues. We are now in phase three um, in which we have been advancing the curriculum. As some would say that even when you're doing enrichment, you're advancing, you're advancing ideas, you're you're, you are educating students. Anytime you have opportunities to think, read, reflect, expand what you know, um, that is still learning. And that is something we've been engaging in um, over the last, over the last, now I guess it's now seven weeks that we've been in school closure. Um, there are still some other questions that we do, we do want to um, address. And, um, but I do think this would be a good point to just ask Sarah Bird, who's on this call, to talk about uh, other things that we have been really been on the forefront of our discussions and priorities is the social emotional well-being and the mental well-being and health of our, our students. And we have made a, a, a large effort to make resources available. And, I, and Sarah, if you could just talk for uh, a minute or two about what uh, the work your department has been doing. Happily, thank you, Kathy. Um, so I know that Dr. Jenger spoke earlier about the high school. I wanna be able to extend his message to um, not only the secondary, but also the at the elementary and preschool level that our um, counselors, social workers have been really doing a, a wonderful job reaching out to families, families that we knew um, and students that we knew that were already um, connected and had wonderful relationships with their counselors before the closure, but also just checking in with um, all the kids on their caseload and making sure that they are reaching out and kids have what they need. Um, the one thing that I, I believe Dr. Bode wants me to make sure I'm mentioning, there's a couple of really wonderful resources. Um, hopefully by now everyone is familiar with or has seen a link to um, a fantastic resource called the Mental Health and Wellbeing website. Um, this was even pushed out by our town manager in a number of his um, daily updates. And this is um, an incredible website with a page for families, a page for students, a page for educators and staff, and a daily calendar um, with multiple live events every single day for all different audiences. So there are live activities for students, live activities for families, um, parent support groups. There are um, AA and NA live recovery meetings. Um, there are a slew of different things. There are PD opportunities, some really great, great offerings, and they're all free. And um, what we've been striving to do, we created this in Arlington, um, and I, I will sort of 
um, put us out there and, and pat ourselves on the back a little bit because we wanted to make sure that we were making this available to everybody, but it quickly gathered steam and we partnered with um, many different districts in the area. And now we've had over 30 different districts all jump on and partner on this website. So we have fantastic resources from all over the state. The Department of Ed actually just put out our website um, to the entire state to share the resources because it was so um, so rich with resources. So I would encourage you all to take a look at the Mental Health and Wellbeing website, uh, which we maintain. And we put out a week at a glance, which I believe all the principals push out through their weekly notification to families. So you can just print it out and take a look and see what's being offered that week. So I highly recommend you take a look at that. And secondarily, um, we always have our partnership with AYCC. Um, all of our social workers and counselors have really robust internal referral processes. They, they meet with kids, they still connect with kids. Um, and if there is a need for increased connection, um, they have their own personal Rolodex of all of the different therapists that are in town or nearby. But now given telehealth, our networks have opened up even more and our um, system of care networks have been really adding clinicians to the list so that there aren't wait lists. So we've been opening up some opportunities and we've even partnered with um, William James College and Interface, which is a fantastic referral line, which allows us to call in pretty much at any time uh, during the work week and be able to connect with master's level clinicians who can talk through a case, make sure that they match um, the perfect the perfect person, hopefully. Um, and if you don't get the right match, they'll stick with you until you have a really solid connection with the therapist and a confirmed first appointment. So we're anticipating an influx in mental health needs. Um, all of the research and the science even coming out um, of China right now is showing us that this quarantine is seeing a mental health curve that we are going to have to flatten as well. So really good mental health hygiene, and we're also anticipating on the school side, um, how can we do our best to make sure the kids have their regular schedules, everything that Kristen mentioned, everything that Brian and, and Matthew were talking about with keeping connections to school, meaningful activities, daily schedules, physical movement, getting outside, really great mental health hygiene to keep that uh, flatten that mental health curve. And then our mental health counselors and our uh, school counselors can really do the best to get kids connected early and identify whoever needs additional services fast uh, without any waiting lists. So I wanted to be able to speak to those. Kathy, did you um, wanna talk about um, any other questions that came up? Well, one of the questions is relates to other issues we're gonna talk about in a second, and that is, what happens after phase four and i think one of the the issues is how do we prepare students socially and emotionally mentally for um what is coming this summer uh this fall and i know that you're giving a lot of thought to that it, as are all of us as we prepare for next year so i may could just come back to you in a minute when we get to that topic all right um so another issue that has come up a couple of times in the questions um, is about Zoom. Dr. McNeil talked about it a little bit, that uh, the decisions we've made and we've, as I, I will tell you that we talk about this actually fairly frequently and sort of catching up as to where we are with this. Um, one of, the, and I'm gonna let um, uh, Susan Bisson, who is our Director of Digital Literacy, talk a little bit about this because um, she has been actually one of the most important people in the district as we've been, uh, though everyone has had a huge role, but teachers rely on the professional development that is being provided through the depart through uh, curriculum instruction and um, your department to have us go into this new world of how we are currently living and educating. Um, Dr. Bisson. Thank you, uh, Dr. Bodhi. Um, uh, hello, everyone. Um, it certainly has been a fairly steep learning curve in moving into this remote learning environment. Uh, one of the reasons, uh, really the primary reason, that we decided we would not use Zoom uh, is because, uh, well, two things, actually. The security issues that became really clear, there was a lot of press uh, around the uh, something called Zoom bombing that was happening where people's meetings were being interrupted uh, by hackers. And we also have available to us within our 
G Suite for Education platform, uh, Google Meet, which is our video conferencing um, application. And to us, it, it, you know, security uh, issues aside, certainly the G Suite app Meet made a lot of sense to us because we could get students links to join meets very easily. Um, and uh, we didn't have to worry about student data privacy and security. Google, um, as you may or may not be aware, is a company who makes frequent updates to their platforms. And they have now incorporated, as of last week, they have incorporated a tiled view so we had um, taken advantage of a free extension to allow people to see one another, students and teachers, and uh, all of our staff people to see one another in a grid view. Uh, but now Google has embedded that ability, that feature right into the app. Uh, we were using it earlier today in a meeting and it works quite well. So, um, you know, we, without going too far uh, astray from what Dr. Bodhi has asked me to talk about, I will say that we are really very focused on student data privacy in the district. Um, and that is really what is, is driving um, our decisions about using certain resources and platforms. Thank, thank you. Um, so, We've had questions about the future. Uh, we're we're here now, and 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 certainly, I think we can all agree that we would all prefer to be back in our schools. That that's a given. Our teachers miss our students. Our students miss our teachers, and there's there's we've come to understand the limitations of you know remote learning. There are a lot, there are some certainly some positives to it. Students can get some lessons you know viewed multiple times. But there's nothing that takes the place of really the, uh, the the personal interaction. But we are where we are, and we're all adjusting to it as best we can. I know that there's continuous anxiety and worry about what's going to happen. And uh, in our immediate future, we're thinking about what's what's going to happen about summer programs. And at this at this stage, I have to honestly tell you that we really don't know. Uh, we're going to be waiting for guidance uh, uh, from the governor and what, what we can what we can possibly do. It's sort of hard to imagine children in a camp situation, um, keeping the kind of social distancing that we're being asked to do right now. So this is something that is being discussed. Um, I, I don't know if everyone uh, that is listening understands that there is a, uh, a leadership emergency management team in town, which I'm a part of. And this is something that we have been talking about. And, and this, this particular group will also be part of the thinking that we have for what could be happening in the fall as well. But right now, um, we, we have already had about a thousand registrations for summer fund. And uh, that's one of our preeminent summer programs that, uh, we're looking at how we can maybe change some of the classes to being virtual. And the community education is working on that right now. Um, and we'll be in touch with people who have already registered. We have summer camps, we have um, summer schools, we have programs for our, our English language learner students. And all of these things right now are on hold until we know uh, what the guidance is going to be around um, social distancing and contact over the next couple of weeks. I think when March 18th, um, not March, May 18th um, comes, the governor is going to talk about more about what is going to start opening up. But key to all of these is the health and safety of our students and certainly our staff as we go, uh, as we plan ahead. So. I believe it will probably have another forum in a couple of weeks when we have a much clearer idea as to what will happen, certainly with summer programming. I know that uh, that all of the administrators in the district have already been talking about what could we possibly do for about summer school. And that is something that is being discussed and thought about. 
clearly we'd rather have it where students were able to come to a school and have some remediation, but that may not be possible either. So that is still in the planning stages as well. And as soon as we have some more definitive plans, we will certainly let you know. So what about um, students repeating a grade? We have, we do not have, uh, we are not planning to retain any students uh, next year. What we know is that we are going to have to begin the next year in all grades, all courses, um, a, re a review of key learnings from this past year. One of the things that will be part of that is actually sort of assessing when we get back as to where students are. But we know that that is going to be necessary. As I, as I uh, talked about before, there's a lot of equity issues. We know that not every student um, is able to uh, do the remote learning for, um, for a variety of issues. But uh, we are certainly continuing to reach out to those students, uh, both uh, through phone calls, through any, any other means, emails, um, to make sure that they're doing fine and, and to encourage them to be part of the, the learning programs that we have right now. So that is the plan with that regard. Now, what about um, what will happen in the fall? Well, if we have uncertainty about the summer still, uh, the fall is certainly very uncertain. But I think that one of the things that is going to be um, uh, better in terms of planning is that we're going to have time to plan. We are, we are going to be looking at, at a couple of, you know, this plan if that happens and that plan if this happens. And there are a lot of things to, to think about in terms of reopening. Uh, certainly first and foremost the safety issues, but there are a whole range of other issues uh, that we would need to address. But as I said, there's there's a group, in, uh, a management team in town. There's also going to be guidance from the Department of Education as well as from the governor um, also. Our hope is we all want to be able to begin school in the fall. Uh, but it may have various, it may not be exactly um, as school as usual. We, we simply don't know that. So again, I would like to put that, that uh, topic um, aside for the time being. It doesn't mean that we're not planning uh, uh, various possibilities because we are. And we have uh, groups that uh, have been talking about it and will, I think once we get through this particular, the planning and the execution, the implementation of this next this phase that we're in right now will have more time um, coming up in later May, June, and certainly the summer to do much more in-depth planning. And then along with that, um, uh, what will be what will happen about the fall athletic season? Again, we don't know that yet. Uh, we would like to know. I know that students are be are very anxious about that as well. And I, and I think just the whole issue of anxiety has been somewhat um, dominating all of our lives as we think about loved ones, if we think about uh, our children, ourselves, uh, and all of the, um, the things that we need to be able to do and manage uh, to, you know, in your own households and certainly what we're doing as well. So to, to what Ms. Bird was saying, Sarah Bird was saying, one of the key things is, is attending to our, everybody's mental health and well-being now so that our students are in the, the space, the emotional social space to be able to come back to school. And um, I think even one of our deans was saying, you know, the, one of the big things will be how do we even adjust in terms of our, our, our routines, uh, our bodies to be able to, to deal, uh, to be different in a, uh, to handle a different kind of schedule than we have now. So there is a lot uh, that we have to plan. And I don't know, um, Sarah, if you want to say a couple more words about this particular issue relative to the start of next year. Uh, sure, I'll be brief. Um, uh, parents and families, you can be sure you will be hearing from us long in advance, not only about logistics, but more so about um, listening sessions, finding out what you all need as adults, because we know from all the research coming out of, of all the SEL networks, all the trauma-sensitive schools networks, that 
Um, all of the work that we need to do is going to be over the summer, making sure that adults, so our families and our staff are working on what they need to be able to social and emotionally return to school, no matter how different it is going to look. So how do we earn the trust with our logistical plan that everyone is safe, not just physically and medically, um, with all of the unknowns, but also social and emotionally, that the environment is a safe and supportive learning environment. And that's our goal. And we're gonna need to work with everyone and hear from everyone what they need in order to feel like Arlington Public Schools is a safe and supportive learning environment. So you will be hearing from us because we need to know what that looks and feels like for everybody. And then we'll be reaching out um, over the summer to build that and to reaffirm that with all of our families and with all of our staff. And then we will be able to sort of like a tripod, be able to as administration and teachers and parents and families be able to hold that space for our students. So that's our plan. Thank you. I, I see that some questions have come in and uh, this is the time, uh, Dr. McNeil, do you want to just take a look at those questions and see who they should be directed to? You have to unmute. Yeah, I had to unmute. <laughs> um, so we have a question from Lydia Carter uh, that, Brian, that is specifically uh, uh, germane to the middle school uh, at Odison. Addison Middle School, and the question reads, are all assignments due on Friday for all teachers, or are some teachers putting due dates throughout the week as if it were a homework assignment? So, uh, Rod, I would say, and to Ms. Carter, I would say over 90% of vast majority are due on Friday. There might be an occasional lesson that they want something in on Wednesday so that it can help the lesson progress. So the example I would give you is you have to write a paragraph in English and on Wednesday, the teacher would like to check to make sure whatever you're writing on the topic is appropriate for what they're gonna do. So if it's an overall assignment, over 90% are due on Friday, there might be a time in which there is an assignment that the teacher wants to check in to make sure that the student is doing well. And so they'll have a check-in to make sure they're on track. But primarily, I would say over 90%, 95% are all going to be due on Friday. Okay, the next question comes from Kathy. And please forgive me if I uh, do not pronounce your last name correctly. Uh, Kathy Lajakano. Uh, will we be back in the fall? And I believe Dr. Bode, excuse me, Dr. Bode uh, did address that, but uh, Dr. Bode, did you want to say something else about uh, plans for the fall? We're looking at different op different possibilities, um, but that, that will have that decision will be made a little bit later. Okay. Uh, the next question is from Katherine Hopkins. Uh, and this could be answered by uh, Dr. Biston. Uh, the title or grid view is not available on APS supplied Chromebooks, at least at the elementary level. Is it possible to fix that? IT blocks adding any Chrome extensions? So we, yes, the, the extensions, the ability for students to add extensions to Chromebooks is restricted for students, but the technology department did enable and inst it's um i might not use the right language uh they made it available for students to add to their meet what what i said um just a bit ago about the fact that google has now released their uh tiled view means that students don't have to access that extension in order to be able to see all of their classmates in a grid view. Thank you. Uh, I'd also say, Dr. McNeil, I'm sorry, um, if, if you are having technical issues like that, um, if you could check in with uh, your classroom teacher and they will get you to one of us in the technology department or the digital learning department, and we will work with you to figure out a solution to any issues you're having. 
Can I just add one thing onto that, that, that I know that you have um, made available to parents. I'm not sure that all parents know that you can be invited into Google Classroom. Now, I imagine that none of the high school parent, students are gonna wanna have that happen, but it is possible. Uh, and that, 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 that uh, how you do it is, is, a, um, is made available through your website. Isn't that correct? Is there anything you wanna say real quickly how to do it? Sure. Um, parents can join their children's Google Classrooms um, to receive email summaries. Um, when you join a classroom, what that when you're invited and you accept the invitation, what that means is that you will receive summaries. Um, if you have an existing Gmail account and you sign up for the summaries using the Gmail account, you actually have a choice of whether to receive a daily Di uh, daily digest uh, of the summary or a weekly summary. Um, it, it, I think there is some confusion around what joining a classroom means as a parent or guardian. And I just want to repeat that it, it means that you will get notifications, summaries about what is being assigned to your student. And we will add that um, to our FAQ document uh, and uh, we will see where else it should go in order to make it available to everyone who needs that information. Thank you very much. Um, next question. Or how are we doing? We had several people ask about the mental health website that uh, Sarah was referring to. She did put it into the chat, a link, but I will also say that it's on our uh, district website uh, you can find it in various places it's on the main page it's also on our enrichment page uh, so it is in uh, different areas and i'm sure that um, our principals have added in various communications that they've sent out to the parent population as well so this website has been shared uh, many many times but if you want to if you do not have the link um, you can go to our main web our main page on our district website and uh, to the enrichment page. Uh, so next question, uh, Mira Dash, are the organizing tips that Mr. Maringer mentioned uh, that the assistant principals have, have this been shared with students and is it available to parents? So Rod, I can send- And are they available to parents? So Dr. Weedale, I can send that out tomorrow to the, um, to the parents. I was going to follow up with some answers to some questions that people had tonight, and I will put that in a, uh, a letter out to parents tomorrow. Okay. Uh, we did address, there's another question about the fall, but Dr. Bodie addressed that. Uh, Julia Matthews, can you explain further why equity issues are keeping our students from ac accessing a more regular school day, synchronous learning? How can we support efforts to close these equity gaps as we go forward? Anecdotally, I hear of many districts having better success when students can start and end a day that is somewhat similar to what they were used to previously. This is particularly concerning to me as we may be in the same situation in, in the fall. And, and I do want to speak to that um, because uh, when people compare us to other districts, uh, I, I would like to emphasize the fact that Dr. Bodie and myself and many of the other members of our administrative team are in, um, we call them round table, round tables, and they have like uh, different types of discussions with uh, other administrators from other districts. And uh, from, I'll just speak from my experience as talking to other assistant superintendents, uh, we are pretty much on the same page as it relates to uh, requiring or not requiring, you know, mandating synchronous meetings, but making an emphasis to utilize asynchronous uh, uh, videos that are created by teachers uh, that are utilized to deliver direct instruction. And again, as Dr. Bodie stated earlier, um, this does provide equity because, you know, many people, I mean, our students have different schedules, uh, which was uh, was, a, was also indicated in our survey that we sent out. And that flexibility is something that our the population of our parents and families are um, more interested in as we move forward with our remote learning plan. So um, the, 
if we had a secret and we've already we've also indicated that we're not going to be able to replicate replicate what we do when we're in session it's just you know it's just not going to be feasible for us to offer that type of schedule and i will open it up to the panel if they want to add to that um explanation at all any does anybody want to uh respond as well i will just i will just uh, add one one point is that there are, you're absolutely right the parents want flexibility um we we do know that routine is important we acknowledge that and hopefully the work that we're trying to set up and creating more structure around it is providing some of that type of structure but the equitability is that there are there are families where um one they're finding that they it's very difficult to be able to share a computer when the parents are working sometimes the older children are taking care of younger children we have situations where family members are ill, students are ill. We have um, families where there's been a lot of disruption due to, ex to things that uh, that's been of an issue uh, for all of us. Um, we know that some some families still do not have um, devices, though we are still distributing them, um, and we want to make sure that that is not an impediment. There, I can, I can go down a list of things that people have actually communicated of how challenging this time is. And, and when you have more than 50% of your family saying it's important to have flexibility, um, that's something that we needed to listen to. And I will say that in, our, in our, the districts that we are part of in terms of our, our league, um, our neighbors, you know, this is this is what other districts are doing is having a blend of synchronous and asynchronous. And this is what has been recommended strongly from our Department of Education. Um, Kathy, I do want to throw in, I, I like Julia, that she's sort of sandwiched in there. How can we support efforts to close these equity gaps as we go forward, which I think is is a nice question for us to consider when we do plan are moving forward. And um, just to put out there as a reference, the Aspen Institute uh, briefs that they just put out the past week or so, and they highlight equity right front and center. And so if people are interested in reading about it, I think that's something we're gonna consider as a district because it is acknowledging um, we do have to consider it in our plans for returning and that um, we're not yet in the midst of that, but it, it absolutely will be something in, in the plans. It absolutely will. All right. Uh, is there any more questions? Uh, because we're coming to the end of our time here. We we do have uh, uh, we have many more questions. Uh, I think that what we can do is that I can make sure that these questions are captured uh, mm -hmm. into a document, and then uh, I can uh, divvy them out uh, to uh, our panel and to other administrators, and then we can collaborate. Uh, to provide responses and then make sure that we share this somewhere on our district website that can um, you know send and communicate out the, the responses and the questions that was asked uh, to our community one of the things that is a dynamic document on our website is the uh, faq and so if you were just if you just google arlington public schools you'll come to the home page of the district and the family FAQ is is getting quite long, but this is where we put information that have been asked of us. So we'll 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 look at those questions. But if there's anything very specific, we'll make sure that um, the people addressed to will answer them. So this is our first time doing a forum. It's a new. Kathy, well, Kathy just yeah. did you want to talk anything about the building project? Because that was one thing that I don't think that we talked to specifically. The high school is a question the high school building project about and how it's being impacted by the school closure if at all well it's being impacted by school closure in a positive way in fact we had a meeting just this afternoon uh, we're going to be able to move some things a little bit um, faster uh, and everybody that goes by the high school can see the fencing that's there uh, so we're going to be um, moving more quickly in terms of, of some of the pre-construction planning. 
and we will also be able to move a little bit more quickly about some of the renovations that have to take place as we move administration offices now back to the uh, the back building the downs building um, but we can certainly there's certainly uh, one thing i would encourage people to look at is the website for the high school building project and you'll have um, all up-to-date information there and you can sign up for any kind of updates so this as i said this is our first um first uh, open, uh forum for parents and uh, i know it's not the most perfect system if we were sitting in the auditorium or a town hall uh, we would have a little bit more uh, give and take but it is at the moment what the best we can do next week we are going to have a forum for elementary parents and that is going to be on wednesday evening and and we'll do the same thing there is, is offer uh, an opportunity to ask questions in preparation for the meeting but thank you very much um, we will be continually in touch either through your, uh, your building principal or from district administration and and i wish all of you to have uh to be safe and healthy um, during this time thank you very much and thank you to all of our panelists this evening appreciate your Appreciate you being here. Oh, uh, Dr. Jang, did you, oh, you're just saying goodbye? Well, no, I actually did have a question and I was saying goodbye. What? I've been answering comments fiendishly over here in the in the thread. Mm -hmm. So I, I hope those are shared somewhere with folks. Yes, I'll tr try to get the capture all of the questions and responses that um, all of you have uh, provided in the chat. I also want to, uh, there was a question about uh, whether or not someone could actually view this uh, forum, since it's being recorded uh, at a later date. Um, did we want to, Adam, did you want to talk about that, uh, about the availability of this recording to our parents and guardians? Sure, the recording will be available on the ACMI website, um, the Arlington Community uh, Media. And uh... Uh, Jeff Monroe, is that? Thank you. ACMI.tv if, if, if for everyone to hear that. All right. Okay. All right. Thank you very much for being here tonight. I know we've had a couple, we've had uh, usually more than 300 participants this evening, which is quite a turnout. If we were, I suppose one of the advantages of the remote is that um, you don't have to leave your homes for this. So we have, if we, this is, was it in the auditorium, it might have only been uh, half this number. So thank you very much, and thank you for um, your continuous support. I know that uh, our teachers appreciate it, and I also know how important it is uh, for your children. So thank you, and good night. The recording has stopped.